Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's program. My name is Yap Yi and I'm the host for tonight's program. I hope everyone is fine and safe. Avoid going out or roaming around. Always remember to wash your hand and avoid touching your face. And most importantly, stay at home. These broadcasts are brought to you by our fellow JPO members and some of the world's greatest musicians that wishes to share their knowledge and help aspiring musicians through their musical journey. We are also providing opportunities for everyone with different interests to learn not performance but transferable life skills. We are doing this series of program because JPO think this will be able to help in uplifting the spirit of everyone in this long period of lockdown. So please help us to do the polling and if you have any questions to ask, please type them right in the Q&A below. I'm very thrilled to announce that today marks the 100th and your uh, 100th interview broadcast in this JPO family series. So with our 100th guest being Tengku Irfan for tonight. Tengku Irfan, a Malaysian pianist, composer and conductor, praised by the New York Times as eminently cultured and possessing sheer incisiveness and power, made his debut at 11 performing Beethoven's Piano Concerto without Opus No. 4, improvising his own cadenzas with Klaus Peter Flor and the Malaysian Philharmonic Orchestra. He has performed as soloist with orchestras worldwide under conductors Nime Yarvi, Christian Yarvi, Robert Spano, Osmo Vanska, David Robertson, George Stelutor, Jeffrey Milarski, among others. Performances include with Axiom, Singapore Symphony, Sao Paulo State Youth, Estonian National Symphony, Minnesota, Peoria Symphony, MDR Symphony Orchestra, and Sydney Symphony Orchestras. He won the 2013 Aspen Music Festival Prokofiev Piano Concerto No. 2 competition and served four consecutive years as pianist for the Aspen Contemporary Ensemble. Irfan received the 2012 ASCAP Charlotte Bergen Award and the ASCAP Morton Gold Young Composer Award in 2012, 2014, and 2017. His compositions have been premiered by the New York Philharmonic MDR Symphony Orchestra, New York Virtuoso Singers, Musica Nova, Malaysian Philharmonic, Peoria, and Singapore Symphony Orchestras. Irfan made his conducting debut with the Musica Nova Orchestra in 2015 and conducted the Malaysian Philharmonic Orchestra during their 20th anniversary gala. He graduated from Juilliard as a double major in piano and composition and currently studying masters in piano under Vera Kaplinsky. Irfan is a proud recipient of a Kovner Fellowship at the Julia School and appointed as Youth Ambassador of the Malaysian Philharmonic Orchestra. Let us welcome Tengku Irfan. Hi everyone. First of all, I'm honored to be here and especially as the 100th guest so i'll do 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 my best to not not mess this up <laughs> but but really thank thank you so much for inviting me here it's a thank you really, so much honor, it's, yeah. it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight so could you share more about what um, we have watched just now yeah so that video was me performing the ravel piano concerto in g major with the malaysian philharmonic orchestra and conducted by Maestro Yun Marco. And what you all heard just now was short excerpts from each of the three movements. We performed this piece about slightly more than a year ago, back in August 2019. And it brings wow. back a lot of great memories playing with MPO. But this performance was also very nostalgic for me, actually, because it's the last time that I went to Malaysia and 
it, it has been over a year now since I came back. So I definitely miss miss Malaysia and would definitely <laughs> love love to come back. Yeah. Uh, well, do you miss the food in Malaysia? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. it's been over <laughs> over a year now. Yeah, yeah. So, what what is the wish list, and does this mean pieces that you really want to play? Yeah. So a wish list is basically a wish list, and it's basically pieces that you wish and what you want to play and learn. I came up with this idea because I feel that it might be. More relevant, especially these days when we have more time at our disposal, and I feel that this can be a source of motivation for you to practice and spend more time with your instrument. When the world was more normal, we are busier with work, and yes. we have to learn pieces that we have to perform, or you know, pieces that our teachers want us to learn. Yeah, but a wish list is really a piece or pieces that you really want to play, or it can be your most desired piece of music. It can be your most favorite piece, or it can also be a piece where you want to fix a certain technique、oh. that you wish to solve. It can be anything really,、um, as long as it is the piece that you want to play, and doesn't have to be a big work even. But the key here is that it has to be. Something that you really desire to make it as a motivation, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so like in a wish list, like for you currently, how many songs do you have in your wish list? Oh yeah, I I have about at the moment about three four pieces in my wish list. I'll I'll go through them. A bit about my experience, <laughs> and and it has grown even more since the pandemic. Wow! So so like in like the the three pieces are there are they all big pieces or only like or、uh, or can you share some of the pieces with us?、Mm, yeah yeah definitely I can、um, I can share share with it.、Uh, before I get to the pieces, I want to say that this.、Um, You know this idea is still really useful, whether there is the pandemic or whether we are in a more more normal normal world situation. And I emphasize it it more these days because of the relatively freer time that we have during the pandemic. Although I understand in these days, sometimes in schools, some teachers give actually more homework. During the pandemic, but I'm、yes. talking about practicing your own instrument, which we all might question: Why do we still practice, even if we are not performing live, at least during this time period? So, if we learn a piece that we love and enjoy, it's more gratifying and enjoyable to learn, and especially with what's going on in the world, we need yeah yeah like this yeah to. Motivate and give give some joy to to our lives. So, I I've been learning the Goldberg variations、um, during the pandemic. So that's a, although that's not a short term project at all. It's <laughs> something much more long term. And the other pieces that I've been doing is、um, a Chopin Mazurka and a oh, Chopin oh. Nocturne. Okay, so. Can this be applied to con to conducting as well? Oh yes, it can be applied to conduct. It can be applied to anything that that you want, whether it is to your instrument, whether it's conducting, performing, anything. So, could you share with us what is your daily routine like before COVID and now? Yeah. So.、Um, Before COVID, every day my、um, my days are filled with classes at Juilliard, rehearsals, and I had chamber music too. And I really love accompanying too,、uh, aside from doing performances. And I try to go watch a few concerts every week, and especially being close to Lincoln Center, there. 
there are lots of um, places. They're just nearby <laughs> and concerts happening. Mm. And of course, also hanging out with my friends. Now, of course, I'm not hanging out physically with my yes. friends, as we know. And also, there are no live concerts currently. But I um, now I have my Juilliard classes online. And I think we all... Um, can relate to this so yes, what, yes. what online zoom zoom yeah. classes really feel although i still have in-person piano lessons with my teacher which is actually very lucky because we live in the same city but of course we do it socially distanced and then i also still practice these days and i do have a bit more time now so with that time i use it to practice my my own wish list and oh. also months ago in april i was part of this project called bolero juilliard which is actually a collaboration with juilliard students and alumni and i i thought it was very cool because we had actors dancers wow. and even we had musical legends like Emmanuel x and yo yo ma too being part, wow. of, part of the video yeah so in this video, um, we had Ravel's Bolero as the centerpiece. This project is innovative in a way that between the sections of Ravel's Bolero, there are other types of music related to the Bolero, like Beethoven and Chopin's Bolero, and even a jazz riff on Bolero. Wow. And yeah, it's, it's very wide ranging. And this is inserted in between the Ravel Bolero. So the Juilliard students, including me, myself, we all recorded our own parts separately. And then our parts um, are tied together. So it's a meaningful collaboration, even if we know we couldn't be physically together. And in fact, if you are curious about this video, you can just search bolero juilliard or juilliard bolero it's on youtube too if you wow, are curious wow. and the other thing that i've been doing these days is is teaching actually although i don't do it too much but i I'm, I'm teaching a bit of composition orchestration to a few wow. students these days through online so you say it we say learning online is very difficult is it very difficult learning online compared to physical? I feel that you know, there are some similarities. I mean, we know we see everyone in small, small yes, boxes. Yes. Yeah. But yet, nothing, nothing beats the in-person interaction still. So, so that's something that I think not just me, but we all, we yeah. all miss, miss that really. Yes, yes. Okay, so moving on to the next question. As an MPO Youth Ambassador, what are your initiatives and responsibilities? Yeah, so as an MPO Youth Ambassador, one of the things that I do is represent the Malaysian Philharmonic Orchestra. And in the past years, I toured with the orchestra to different places and states in Malaysia. In 2019, we went to Kedah, Perak, and Penang. The year before that, we toured to Sabah and Sarawak. Oh. And one of our concerts was actually in Kota Kinabalu too. And <sighs> during, during these trips, we, we did concerts and we also performed for school students too. And aside from touring, we also did... Um, other things like outreach, like aside from uh, playing for school students. And when we're not touring, I would do activities that are related to MPYO, either collaborating or performing or conducting with them. Uh -huh. And in fact, later this month, I'm, I will be involved in a digital camp with MPYO. So I will be giving some talks and participate in some webinars too by oh then. that's that's great so um what are the greatest differences for you in between malaysia and us yeah this is hard because i can't really compare 
Malaysia with the US since I don't also I don't really spend a lot of time in other parts of the US except for a few days for my performances most of the time I'm actually in New York and New York itself is different from the rest of the US so maybe it might be easier for me to compare New York to with with other cities okay and I, I really appreciate being lucky enough to be in New York because it's one of the major international hubs for music especially in terms of performers teachers yes and musicians <laughs> themselves you know, because a lot of them internationally convert here so one of the great advantages of being in New York is that it enables me to expose to a wider range of music and teachings from great people of the world just by being here and since i live close to lincoln center um, the david geffen hall the metropolitan opera juilliard school all of those are close together and even carnegie hall is wow. also within a walking distance so a lot of concerts happening at the same time in multiple venues although there are no live performances understandably during to the pandemic but i'm talking yeah, yeah, yeah. performances in a more more normal world setting yeah <laughs> so so in terms of like society do you find it very hard to to adapt to the us environment at first it took it took some some adjusting but i realized it's embracing and heartwarming to know people from all walks of life and also people coming from many different places yes there are a lot of new yorkers in new york but there are also a lot of people from different international backgrounds so i i i learn more about the different people too wow so how many how many performances do you have at an average monthly in a normal world normal setting in a normal setting it it depends actually because um i i have different schedules sometimes every week every month every year but i would say you know in a normal setting maybe once every two weeks or once every month wow. although when i yeah although when i go to aspen which i do for some summers i would sometimes i i would do a performance every single week or maybe a few during a week wow so are there times. so are there any like are there times where you feel like oh it's very tiring you want to take a rest or 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 maybe up till the up till level where you feel like you want to give up are there any instances of that Luckily for me I I never get tired of performing. Wow. I I feel that when I perform I I mean, I'm lucky to have uh, opportunities to to perform. Yeah, at the same time I never feel overbooked or overworked because wow. it's I know it's hard because there are some musicians out there who you know who do have so many concerts and then it affects them but i'm lucky at least so far that i've not been affected that way although i have to say that during a performance even if i'm performing a lot it doesn't feel tiring because there's so much adrenaline yeah. um, so there's there's that <laughs> excitement which is um you know some people might think it's a negative thing because you know you rush but at the same time yes, it yes, can yes. be it can be a very good thing if you yeah. You, know, you you use it to as as a positive energy as oh. you know, to to bring the audience in. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, could you share with us around like how much time would you say is enough for you for for practice per day? So it it's very different for everyone. In general, for me, I try to not go. beyond 3 hours of practicing and i think um, even shopan himself said not more than 3 hours I mean, <laughs> also because i feel that there's a, there's a certain time 
that we practice and after some point it feels like we are repeating the same yes, thing. Yes. I feel that when we are practicing it should be really intense and really focused. So sometimes maybe even one two hours might be enough some wow. days for me. So it's matter about it it matters more about how much you put in and focus. And sometimes even when I'm not physically practicing at the piano, I will be thinking about the pieces. So when I think about the pieces, so it winds up being actually maybe more than three hours. Yeah. So it's <laughs> so I don't count practicing just at the piano, but I guess when you're thinking about really at the piano, not more than three hours every day. So it I'm curious, in terms of like theory for your composition stuff, how do you balance that between practicing with your piano? Yeah, so I I don't know if I would call myself uh, good <laughs> at, at balancing because uh, I, why not say that with piano, it's more consistent because it's something you know, directly related to, I mean, it's a musical thing to practice, but yet it's also uh, related to your own muscles. Yeah. So you have to regulate it. So it's almost every day. Although I, I have to say, I do take a day off at times. Uh, and I think that's also important to know because even if you practice every day, sometimes it's nice to take a break a bit to let yeah. the music rest so that you don't get bored with it and I'll, yeah. I'll come back more actually about that too because it does tie a bit to the wishes <laughs> idea so but i would say i i, I do take take a break too wow okay so do you do you play much chamber music and accompaniment too yes i i do i mean it was much more before the the pandemic um so it's something that I love to do. I think maybe because as a pianist, a lot of the time that we spend practicing is a very solitary activity. <laughs> but if if um, if I were playing a string instrument, or, or let's say if I play the cello like you do, I, there's, <laughs> there's orchestra music. So, yes. you know, you are, um, you, you're constantly with people so yeah. but but with the piano sometimes it might be um it might be easier to feel lonely so when i'm playing chamber and when i'm accompanying people i i learn a lot actually about collaboration oh, and i yeah. feel like there's no there's no other way that's more more gratifying <laughs> than doing this <laughs> so so which are the which are you more passionate about playing the piano conducting or composing it's very hard i feel that <laughs> i need i need all three because i mean first of all i love playing piano composing conducting i feel that for me myself i can't just do one because i realize all of them are interconnected one one of the oh, things yeah. that i yeah one of the things that i aspire to do is to to be as much involved as I can in different facets of, of music because I, I I enjoy piano a lot but yet I really love listening to orchestra music chamber opera so I feel that I I need um, all, all three of them <laughs> so like, like currently which do you feel like you want to do more? Um, <laughs> Currently, yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, I've been composing a bit too during during the pandemic. So, you know, I've been writing time to time and I've been practicing um, quite a bit these days too. So I guess maybe the practicing takes up more time, but at the same time, during break, I love listening to music or read scores. So I'm afraid I, I, I still can't <laughs> lean towards one because I realize I, oh. you know, I, I do each one. I mean, you know, I don't 
um, you know, I focus intensely on each one, but yet I feel that maybe it's just my personality to to embrace and to yeah. be curious about you know, other other genres. But I feel like as a musician, when when you learn something about you know, that's different from your own yeah. instrument, you it helps your instrument in yes, an yeah. interesting way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I learned a lot from that. So which one which one did you start at first? Uh, can you share with us your journey of learning these three? The piano, conducting, and composing? Yeah, so piano started first. It started with my dad buying an electronic keyboard um, when I was about six, seven. Uh, I mean, he didn't envision me being a pianist or anything back then. I, I didn't myself at that time, but um, it was for me to fool around. But then I remember with the Yamaha keyboard, they have this selection of pieces that you can choose. And I found myself gravitating to uh, the Chopin <laughs> Valse, uh, Opus 64, number one. And, you know, being being a young kid, I, I love fooling around. So it started from there that I started piano. Composing actually started from improvising. I was improvising um, during my free time, but not because... Um, I was learning improvising. Also, being a kid at, at that time, yeah. <laughs> I I got easily bored. So sometimes I had pieces. Um, so I I learned, but then I got I got bored of the same pieces. So I I wanted to to learn different pieces. <laughs> or if I'm not learning different pieces, I would just fool around or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So that that led to improvising, and imp and I started writing down my improvisations. So that led to composing. Conducting came um, also a bit after that. I started more, started watching more performances by the MPO. And, you know, I got to love the orchestra sound. So I, I, I was oh. just, you know, I, I, I really love the orchestra. So, and I wanted to know how the orchestra works, you know. So I, I started watching more orchestra performances and reading and studying scores. So I guess that's pretty much how how I started. Wow, so in terms of piano, when did you have your first physical piano at home? <laughs> I would say I was perhaps eight or nine. I I had an upright upright kawaii at, wow. um, at my house in Malaysia, that's when I yeah, that's when I started to evolve from the wow. digital keyboard to to the real weighted weighted piano. Wow! Did did you find it hard, like between the the electronic piano and the and the upright piano? At first, it it took adjusting because when I was playing the digital keyboard, I. I, I, I barely tried what the real piano feels like. So when the upright came in, then I started to 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 adjust to the key action. So but 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 you know from that point onwards I I can see you know I, I, I should be I should be used to to, to playing. Okay, piano. so would you say listening to a lot of music and recordings are important? Yes, I feel that as a as a musician, it's it's important to be aware of recordings, uh, both newer recordings by musicians nowadays, and also older recordings from the past. Because for me, listening to as many recordings uh, is actually very helpful. It's a great learning experience actually because you. If if you learn a piece to listen to many interpretations, um, it's not about copying them, but rather to find something that's inspiring, um, or something that captures you from, or from each interpretation that you find. So I guess with more listening to different types of music and as diverse as you can, you, I mean, not only you are more informed as a musician, but it gives you 
many more ideas that yeah. you might not think of you know when yeah. you're practicing alone yes 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 so do you play other instruments beside the piano i don't actually i <laughs> i only play the piano although i actually feel that i should also learn another instrument too or at least explore or explore another instrument yeah like what oh my how do i say this okay so so like 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 what do you really want to play beside the piano because currently you haven't tried other instruments or like so which one is like oh i want to try this one it's hard you know, because <laughs> being being a composer i i i start to embrace you know as many instruments oh. as as i want but i do know that if i were to choose an instrument it might be a wind or a brass instrument and i think it has something to do with the idea of breathing because i know as a pianist and i think for you know you pianists out there you know you hear your teachers telling you phrase this sing this and i feel that as a wind player or a brass player you um you know most of the time or practically all the time is all about breathing and as a, as a pianist um, sometimes we have the advantage that you know we don't really need to breathe we just press the keys but yes, you know, yes, sometimes yes. we often miss the longer phrase yeah and the idea idea of singing so i think if i would learn another instrument it would be you know, maybe a wind or a brass instrument okay so uh how how do you sing with a piano it's hard. i mean first it has to come within yourself i mean um, you you play but yeah at the same time you think about the line as you're playing and also breathing and breathing is a is an important thing i think also for pianists because sometimes we get caught in the way of you know hitting each key but yeah, then yeah. when we when when we breathe it gives a certain flow i mean it's not just for other people other is also for me to remind myself to um, as i'm practicing pieces to so so you're saying that um you must hear it in your mind before you play it right yes uh, definitely because if you don't hear it in your mind then the sound that comes out might not be the sound that you want or it might be already yes. too late before you know you can hone the sound yeah. that you want okay so knowing what our jasolta philharmonic orchestra is doing with all these events and so do you have any advice or views regarding the activities that we are doing i mean first first of all i'm very impressed with all your initiatives and to be honest it's really inspiring for me to see how you all really work very hard towards making sure that every kid and everyone has musical education and even when they can't afford it and it further stresses that music is for everyone and that everyone deserves music I and mean, which is yes. what you are all striving for and also i find these interviews really great and i see familiar <laughs> names and great names who are doing the, the mm. talks too so i am i'm honored to be part of this i myself do not have anything to add to what you all are doing but i guess just keep on doing what you all have been doing even though these broadcasts are a special initiative during the pandemic i hope you still do this even in the normal world setting too so yeah i i just admire the resilience the selflessness that you have in yeah. making education available to everyone ah oh, thank you thank you very much for your kind words so okay we have our first q and a question hi from malaysia do you find it hard to adjust your music learning and studying when you were young it was it was challenging yes i i won't lie because when i was young especially in primary school and i i remember there were subjects and when i started a bit of secondary school too it was it was hard at that time i remember 
most of my time was actually doing school work, doing essays, homeworks, you know, studying for tests. And I think yeah. we all can relate to yeah. that, that type of school yeah. life. So I, I was part of that too. So music was not another work for me. In fact, it was, um, you know, if I, I treat it even as a break. Even. Like a stress so, relief. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really a stress relief. I mean, I think that's important to point out because, you know, sometimes when we are working, we're practicing really hard. We have to remember, after all, we're doing this as, you know, as enjoyment. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I mean, even if music can be work, but music is still meant to be enjoyed. So at that time, when I was busy with academics, it was my stress reliever. Wow. <laughs> okay, the next question, Tengku Irfan. Do you find it more competitive in the States than in Malaysia as far as music is concerned? Mm, this is an interesting question actually because you know there's music competition all everywhere, around the world. Yes. You know, everywhere. I mean even in Malaysia, yeah. even in the in the States too. I mean to get a job in music is is very difficult, um, as as we all know. But what I experience here in the States, at least in Juilliard, is that um, you know, even though all the students are really great at what they're doing, and you know, I, I learned so much from being around them. The thing that I learned is that everyone is very collaborative, even though we are pursuing the same path. So even if we, even if my friends are in the same competition, we we don't, we are not competitive, but we are actually collaborative. We support each other. We say good luck, or even in a even in a concerto competition, I see friends who you know who accompany each other, um, oh. for a so the camaraderie is very strong, even within competitions. Wow. Okay, so hello, Maestro Tengku. It is really great to see a young Malaysian making Malaysian proud in the world of classical music. Please keep up the good work and please share with us your aspirations for the future of Malaysian music. So, I mean, with, with Malaysian music, I feel that, you know, as I'm seeing more programs, more initiatives, and especially what the Jesselton Philharmonic Orchestra has been doing too, I feel that it's heading in a good, good direction. I mean, we just need as many people as we can introduce to music and, music, and giving yes. music education possible and also breaking the barrier between um, you know, professional musicians and you know, musicians who are learning because I, I know that sometimes when someone gets into classical music it might be it might feel intimidating at first yeah. so, but, but you know the thing that I love about classical music is not because it's intimidating or anything because it because of how accessible it is to me so it's emphasizing the accessibility and how it it can attract everyone so I think you know just going in that direction will you know, hopefully gain more more supporters more people yes. in learning classical music oh, okay Talking about competition and festival, do you think participating in them is a crucial part of crafting and preparing yourself better as a professional musician? Yes, uh, definitely. You know, even um, you know, for me, I I myself don't don't really like competitions, so oh. I don't enter. But then, um, but then the good thing about competitions, I realize, is that it. It is a really big incentive for you to work work hard because you know you you you, you want to be playing your best every yes, time and yes. especially in a competition with people judging. So it's an incentive to work. I find that with competition, you know, it's different everywhere, and I know you know we all want to get the big prize. Yes, but yes. the <laughs> big learning experience I feel is the journey of the competition itself is the fact that you see how much you work for it and how much you improve. Yeah. And I think that's, it's more gratifying to see it that way. 
rather than to <laughs> aim aim for the big prize. Yeah. What about festivals? Festivals festivals are good because you you get to know people from you know many different places and festivals are actually very important places I think for connections because a lot of people usually go there I mean depending on the music festival it's you know it's fun because you get to collaborate meet new yeah. friends but what's important about festivals I think is to keep the friends that you have because yes they are also your good friends your good buddies but who knows one day you know you you will be still working together and maybe one one of them are hiring you, you know, to perform <laughs> a concert for them so that's the thing i realized about festivals and the other thing i want to say about festivals is that is um it's a great time to learn repertoire i mean i know with orchestra musicians too when in a festival you learn so much rap and oh if you don't mind i might talk a bit about the wishlist idea because it also sure, sure, sure. fits to the idea of a festival because in in a festival i know um because i've been to the aspen music festival for several years it's also a good time for me to learn a lot of pieces because you know there are a lot of concerts there are a lot of people so it inspired me more to learn different pieces and you know and these pieces are also part uh, part um, of my own wish list too and if you don't mind i might talk just a bit about um how i even before this actually i had this wish list idea even when i was nine nine or ten even although wow. when i was nine or ten <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't called a wish list but it was called something else um because i remember at that age i was learning you know, the trinity syllabus and i think I think we all know that we have to learn the three three set pieces. Yes. <laughs> but then I remember after playing this piece pieces for some time I didn't feel enough and you know I got bored easily and I wanted to play more music just for wow. fun. So at that age I remember I went to YouTube and I searched great pianists like Yevgeny Kisin, Alfred Brando playing Beethoven and Schubert sonatas. And I thought you know these were cool to play, but you know this sounded I think too adventurous for you know, when I was <laughs> yeah. nine or ten. But I realized being younger, you realize that being naive and not aware of certain things actually you know, brings a certain courage and fearlessness. So you know I didn't tell. I remember I didn't tell my teacher at the time when I was learning these pieces. When I but you know I started playing and practicing these pieces for fun. You know of course I didn't play. It well that time, but it's about the idea of learning yeah, yeah. and enjoying, you know, enjoying the music. And I think with festivals, you get exposed to, you know, different instrumentalists, different types of music. So that might inspire your wish list too. Wow. So like you said, uh, like around nine, ten years old, you were ex exploring and then trying on um, practicing these pieces because you were so into it. What's the longest amount of time you've been on a piano? Oh, I don't know. I would say um, maybe if on a day, a day of practicing piano, perhaps maybe, maybe four hours. But I also realized that a lot of my day is actually spent on listening to other types of music. Um, you know, I, I practice too, but a lot of it is also listening and score reading. I want to emphasize score reading too because um, you can practice even not at your own instrument. Uh, I've been doing that more actually, um, especially during the pandemic, you know, because sometimes there's a lot of free time, you know, it's better to divide up rather than to just be stuck at the piano for eight hours. And I find out when you do score reading, you find things that you might be ignoring when you're practicing because when you're practicing you're worried about the mechanics yes. of the instrument <laughs> but then when you are reading the score on your own yes you know it might be more challenging to hear the music in your mind but then you notice the articulations the slurs you know, this these details that you might be ignoring yeah. when when practicing oh okay 
So what is your opinion in playing contemporary repertoire? I think it's essential for for all musicians to be exposed to contemporary repertoire because you know as much as we we learn the classical repertoire, you know, Beethoven, um, Chopin, or or you know or um, you know romantic composers. Um, I mean, it's important to have the standard core repertory as it is to yeah. to be acquainted with. Newer music. I I myself have been playing quite quite a bit of new repertoire. I I find an affinity to it because um, you know so because I like sometimes the adventurousness of the music music of today, and I feel like it's refreshing to hear. The other thing I want to say is that you don't have to like everything, but yeah. you have to be exposed to. Everything, you know, as much as you can, you know, it it will make you a more diverse musician to be exposed to all types of repertoire, even contemporary repertoire. So, um, any Malaysian composition? Um, I know you know there are you know there are a number of Malaysian composers, but I know one of my uh, favorite. Uh, contemporary Malaysian composers is Tazul Izan Tajudin. He's a great um, composer, st- still currently living, and he writes in, you know, he explores um, extended techniques and unusual techniques, but he makes it poetic in his own language. So there yeah. are, um, you know, uh, many composers, even Malaysian composers out there um, doing cool stuff. So among all the all the different oh I forgot this word oh uh period yes period among all the different periods like classical baroque romantic twentieth and like now the present which one is your favorite and which one do you feel like oh it's kind of hard to understand oh you know if. You know, I I'm bad at choosing again, so I I have to oh. say all. But um, I have phases. Um, so you know, some phases I might listen to more oh, of yeah. a certain type of music. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I lately understand. I've been I've been listening to more uh more baroque um related pieces and and even a bit earlier. But I think that's partly because I'm also taking a class on baroque concerto. Bar- oh, wow. But also I'm. I'm curious to know more because I know that I don't play that much baroque repertoire, so I'm exploring myself uh, more in the earlier music direction. But I'm I'm just curious about you know, because there are so many things that I I, I don't know too. Yeah. Wow, that's great. <laughs> that's very fun. So, on behalf of JPO, we would like to thank you for dedicating your time and energy into this uh, interview. Despite the pandemic that's been happening right now, and we would also like to thank everyone who has attended and supported this program. You guys have been great. I hope you guys got the answers you wanted. For those who are waiting for your answer, please stay as Tunku Irfan will answer your questions through the Q and A below later. Please stay. Uh, please stay. Please check for the link at our JPO Facebook page and stay tuned. And for anyone interested to share any of our program with your family and friends, it will be on our it will be on our Facebook page, Jesselton Fiamon Orchestra. So now the picture that's been displayed right now is our international virtual music festival, which will be held on the 18th to 20th of December. So we will have um, we will have forty three speakers, hundred plus performers, three concerts, uh, discussion forums, twenty three maestro clinics, and music unboxing. So for some of the terms which are, you're 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 not used to hearing like maestro clinics and music unboxing, you can check them out at our website www jpomusicfestival dot org, which is circled below there. And so this program will be on pause as we will have 
our international view, uh, virtual music festival and also the Christmas holidays for the next few interviews. And this program will then resume on the 27th of December. And here, as you can see, are uh, the, the, in, the music festival is uh, a three-day music festival. So it's on the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, which is the 18th, 19th, and 20th of December. And that is the schedule. And then, hold on. So um, there are there are different speakers in this section. So you can check them out. We have their bio, their information of what they play, what what their experience they have shared out on on during the music festival. So um, now I will lead the prayer to end tonight's program. So please pray in whatever faith you believe in for the COVID-19. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in how you have guided and equipped people in their jobs and have provided in the past. It can be scary and overwhelming not knowing how bills and obligations will be met or to not be able to provide for families. As people feel financial strain during the uncertainty, Bring them comfort and peace, reminding them that you are there for them. Provide for them in their times of need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So that will be all for tonight. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Irfan, for tonight. It's been a really great pleasure. <laughs> and thank you for, for inviting me. This is, this is a lot of fun. Okay. Good night. Bye-bye.